Um, I'm going to start with a quick joke that I heard this morning. So there's a seeker who's kind of looking for enlightenment. And so he, uh, he hears that the, you know, the wisest guru in the world is living on top of this mountain in India. So he starts this trek you know, up into the hills, up into the mountains. And it's a really tough journey. He's, you know, he's slipping and falling on the rocks. Um, he's sort of fighting off wolves. Um, but you know, eventually, after a couple of weeks, he, he gets to the top. And, and sure enough, there's you know, this guru just sitting there meditating, you know, cross-legged in, in front of a little hut. So the seeker says, oh, wise guru, like, you know, I've come to ask you, like, please tell me, what is the secret of life? And the guru just sort of you know, nods serenely and says, ah, yes, the secret of life. Well, it's a teacup. And the seeker just says, a teacup? I came all this way? Uh, you know, I went through all this stuff, and you're telling me it's a teacup? And the guru says, oh, yeah, may maybe it isn't a teacup. That's the punchline. <laughs> <laughs> the best jokes are when you have to obviously say what the punchline is. All right. So let's get, let's get stuck in. Uh, so I'm afraid I'm going to do a little bit of a bait and switch today. Um, you know, when I submitted this uh, talk, uh, you know, I was going to talk about OCI, some of the work we've been doing, and standards. Um, but honestly, um, you know, after, I do have a talk on this, but sort of digging into it, um, it's just not that interesting. There's a lot of sort of technical detail about JSON formats and you know, tables and configuration parameters and awkward history about industry politics. Um, but we've already had a bunch of technical information today about you know, what a container can be, like some of the talks from, from Liz and Vish. And you know, tomorrow, we'll go into more depth about what, what's inside containers. Um, so I want to take a little bit of a different track um, and talk about uh, this sort of metaphor I've been explore kicking around to, to explain some of this container stuff. Um, but if anyone's like, really desperate to hear about OCI, there'll be a little bit about that in there, too. Um, and you feel free to come up and harass me over a beer to get into more details. So today is going to be a story with a bunch of different things. Like um, we're going to start off with, with you know, the humble shipping container. Going to talk a bit about some crazy ideas like infinite software. I'm going to throw in some cheesecake, um, one of my favorite foods. Uh, talk a bit about IKEA furniture, um, and sort of finally get to 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 kind of the, the, the culmination of this process, which is the mechanical piano. And then, as I said, we'll, we'll throw in a bit about standards as well. So let's start uh, with a little bit about OCI, just to make sure I fulfill the sort of contractual, contractual obligation, um, and then we can come back later if, if we have time. Um, what is OCI? So as the sort of name suggests, it's an open container initiative. It's sort of an initiative, um, which means, uh, technically speaking, it's a, it's a sub-foundation of the Linux Foundation. Um, and it was formed, uh, so, it, so it sort of just provides like a loose governance structure uh, with some sub-projects to create uh, open industry standards around, around software containers. Um, it was formed a couple, oh, a couple of years ago now, uh, to kind of to end the container wars. Um, I really hate that term. I don't know why I'm still propagating it. Um, really, it was kind of to formalize the, what was the de facto standard, the Docker, Docker image format, um, and kind of had that as the agreed on starting point that we could use uh, to kind of move forward, um, you know, sort of agree that that's the baseline, and then we can add new features and stuff like that. Um, and all working on this stuff together, beautiful, beautiful harmony where all the systems can understand this format. So there's two kind of key projects within, within this initiative, um, one of which is the image format, which is what most people think about when they think about a, they're building a container image and stuff like that. Um, and that's more what I'm going to be focused on with, with, with the metaphor a little bit. Um, but then there's also the runtime specification, which is uh, you know, about how, what's actually running. Again, coming back to like Liz's talk, for example, that's all these things like namespaces and C groups and what they actually mean uh, at runtime. So you can kind of think of the, the goal of OCI being to just answer this question, what is an application container, um, in a way that we can all agree on. You know, is it these, these different, different technologies? Um, it's all of these things, yes. And again, as I said, it's the actual technical details are not necessarily that interesting. It's a, fundamentally, it comes down to being a tarball, a bunch of associated uh, JSON metadata um, that's telling your computer how to understand this thing. So instead, I'm going to talk, as I promised, uh, about metaphors, how we can think about you know, what containers are. So, of course, the metaphor that you know, started this whole conversation around containers is, is, and normally still kicked around is the, the shipping container, the physical shipping container. I've never really been entirely happy with this one. So I spent a bit of time thinking recently about you know, how we could improve on this um, and maybe come up with a better analogy if I had to describe software containers to, to people who are you know, new to containers or who are maybe a little bit uh, less technical. So let's start first with the shipping container and just some of the problems I have with it. Well, actually, let's start with the good. What's good about shipping containers as, as a metaphor for, for software containers? Well. <clears throat> You know, a lot of the value comes from it being this agreed on format, the size and shape. So if you take a shipping container, um, you, know, you build one and you put some stuff in it, you know that you can send it around the world. And you know, anyone that uh, understands shipping containers uh, can take it and put it on their truck or can put it on their train. Um, and you know, there's a lot of power in that, because you can, uh, you know, you can be pretty, pretty confident that someone else on the other side of the world with a crane is going to be able to move your shipping container. Um, and all of those, those, those tools that can work with these things are agnostic to what's inside. You know, the transports don't really care. 
So looking at it from one angle, this is a very attractive metaphor for, for application containers, indeed where it sort of came from, because again, application containers are something you want to like build on one side of the world, and you want to be able to have this consistent experience of how it's used uh, anywhere, whether it's whether you're using it yourself or whether you're uh, submitting it to someone else in another country, um, and you want them to be able to run your application. Um, so the analogy from, you know, different tools like cranes, ships, trucks, and trains. We have things like registries, like the Docker registry or the Quay registry. We have different build tools for building containers. Then we have different run times uh, for running them. So, you know, obviously if you, if you use Docker and you build a Docker image, you can be pretty confident that you can send it to anyone else using Docker, um, and they'll get a, probably the same thing happening when they run it. Um, but at the moment, you know, it's a little bit loaded the way I'm phrasing that because uh, you know, what's motivating our work in the OCI stuff is to mean that if you're building a Docker image, you can't necessarily just use it with Docker, you can also use it with a bunch of other things. So that's about decoupling, uh, you know, this image format, decoupling the shipping container format from a particular vendor, because, you know, uh, you, know you don't want it to, to have, like, a shipping, shipping company like Merck suddenly deciding, well, they're going to change, change their shipping size a bit, and then suddenly all of these other systems that you have in place, uh, you know, aren't able to use it. So that's what's good about the shipping container, but, but what's wrong with it? Why does it bother me? Well, first, there's this, this sort of uh, double-edged sword, I guess, of, of the, the agnosticism to what's inside. So operators can ignore what's inside when they're transporting it, but it also means that um, you can't necessarily, you know, you don't know what to do with it. Uh, you can understand how to deal with it from the outside, but then once you open, in, open it up, like, it's totally unstructured. Um, so, for example, if I, someone sends me a shipping container, um, I just, I don't know what's inside it, I don't know what to do. You know, it could be full of things like yogurt, or it could be full of smaller containers, and once I open it up, it could be completely jam-packed, and I just, I just don't know where to start or how to deal with it. Whereas with application containers, um, this really doesn't work. Like, the application container, for it to be useful, you have to have some hint uh, when you're receiving this container, what should I do with it? Um, so the, in, 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 the, in this tarball of all these files, you know, I need to kind of know where am I going to start execution, for example. Um, you know, if I have an Apache, uh, shipping, an Apache application container gets shipped to me, I need to know which executable uh, is, is, is I should start running with. Um, so then software containers are really only useful if there's some sort of self-describing uh, bit about them. So, oops. In theory, we could probably, you know, iterate on our shipping container and kind of solve this by adding a manifest. And this could be some, you know, standard uh, description about what's in the container, where exactly they are, um, what we should start, you know, when, when, I, when I open up the container, what's the first thing I should start looking at? And, you know, that gets us a bit further. And if we go and look at software containers, we see this sort of direct analog here uh, of this manifest that gets shipped with the container that describes, uh, you know, where you should start looking in the container. So that, that gets us a little bit further. But then we come up against these sort of physical issues that you know, most physical metaphors, I think, um, face, where it's just very hard to, to, to find analogs from the software world. Uh, if we first, we start talking about uh, size. So shipping containers are you know, a fixed size, um, and that's what provides that, uh, you know, that, that, that ability to be able to ship them anywhere and, and deal with them predictably. But that totally breaks down when we start to think about software containers, because also they vary, all, obviously they vary considerably in size. You might have a really lightweight container that's just built, built with just your app, or you might have you know, someone's built from an Ubuntu thing and it's got hundreds of, hundreds of megabytes with a much fuller environment. Another really uh, troublesome thing about shipping containers is that, um, you know, they're quite cumbersome. You know, they're quite difficult to build. You need to sort of forge all the metal, put it together. They're quite heavy. You need a quite a, 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 you know, powerful equipment to be able to move them around. Um, and that might be fine if you have all those tools, but obviously that also doesn't really map well to the software world where software is, is so easy to copy. You can just like in an instant, uh, you know, send it across the world. Um, and every time you're doing that, you're sort of making a copy of it. And then the final problem is that um, where sort of the metaphor breaks down a bit is that shipping containers are reusable. So you, know, so you build it once and you're probably gonna use it hundreds of times. Um, you're gonna you know, take it from one place to another. You're gonna take everything out, put new stuff in. Um, Application containers, on the other hand, has, has already been touched on a bit, you know, they're immutable, and the idea is that you make a completely new copy of it every time, and then you can maybe start, you know, start using it, but then after you've started using what's inside, you're probably gonna throw it away, and the next time you start another cont uh, container, you're doing a, a completely new copy. You never have to sort of empty it out. So this is, I want to sort of focus on these points for a second and sort of dive a bit deeper into, into something which is really core to the idea I ended up with, um, and why I think most physical analogies of software kind of fall short. And that's that there's these few, like, really transformative things about software that we don't necessarily see in the physical world. First of which is that you can copy it very, very cheaply. You know, as long as you sort of have electricity um, and a computer, um, you can make an immediate copy. Um, because, you know, every time you're downloading a file or, or something like that, you're actually just making a completely new copy of it. You're not taking the original. And then 
the other amazing thing is that it doesn't have any of these physical resource requirements. You don't need to uh, you know, go and, uh, if you want to run a new bit of software or take a copy of the software, you don't need to go and get some new physical resources beyond uh, electricity. As long as you have the electricity, um, which is essentially the only sort of input, the only resource, you can basically do what you like with software without limit. Obviously, there's some constraints around you know, memory and CPU, but for, for so many things that, could, with, that you can do with computers these days, those are sort of effectively, effectively limitless. So if we dive in a bit more and try to think about you know, why that is, why is, these, why is software so powerful? Well, what actually is software? At the end of the day, it's just a really long stream of bits, ones and zeros, as that's you know, one way to break it down. It's not really useful for this, this contrast. So another, a better way to think about it, a little bit more abstractly, it's, it's a sequence of instructions, right? A potentially endless sequence of instructions. Um, and a computer is just the, a CPU is just a really dumb, you know, dumb system that just follows these instructions, but really, 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 really fast. And that's where the power comes from. So, it's, doing the, it's just basically just when you're copying software, you're just sort of recreating a sequence of instructions, and you give it to the computer, and it sort of executes them again. So again, it's pretty basic stuff, but um, it's, what's really important here is that the, the set of instructions can be kind of self-reflexive, um, so it can be, inf you know, effectively can run infinitely. Um, and and, and by, by building on top of this, you can, you can do some really powerful things. So if we think about software this way, it makes a lot more sense about why we can copy it so easily, because basically all we're doing is copying a list of instructions, and these instructions can be self-referential, uh, so they can you know, potentially loop, so we can get sort of infinite behavior from a, a finite set of instructions. And then you know, the hard work is done, basically done by the CPU, just sort of blindly following these instructions, recreating the original experience that we, that we were striving for when we created the software. Okay, so what are we... Kind of going back to the physical metaphors, looking for something better than a shipping container, what do we have in the physical metaphor that is a series of instructions? Well, the first uh, kind of direction I started to think of was a recipe. So, you know, a recipe is basically a list of things to do, mix this with that, um, add this to that, so on and so forth. And you can sort of you know, see how this might be like what a CP is doing. You know, add this number to that number, um, mix, stir, put it in the oven, et cetera. But more importantly, you can really easily copy and distribute uh, recipes. You can just, you know, do a photocopy or a fax or, or write it up by hand, give it to a friend, and then, you know, in principle, they follow these instructions you've given them, and they get exactly the same, exactly the same result. So, like this delicious cheesecake here. Application containers, uh, similarly, it's a sequence of instructions. It's very easy to copy and distribute and give to your friend. Um, and then, in principle, you know, their, their CPU will follow the instructions and get exactly the same result. But in this case, you know, it's not necessarily a cheesecake, but maybe like a website, like this simple website here. So, I think this is you know, attractive um, because it shows us how we might be able to, this metaphor is kind of attractive because it shows us how we might be able to, to pass this around and give it to other people to create exactly the same thing. So if I give you the code for this website, you can probably run it yourself. Um, similar to how you can, you can, again, distribute a recipe to, to multiple people and have them, have them create the same result multiple times. But then there's another kind of problem here with the physical realm. Um, which is that annoying thing about resources. So, you know, when you're cooking, cooking something, the recipe isn't the only input. You also need to get all these ingredients. Um, and these are finite, these are harder to come by, and there's more kind of variation or inconsistency. So maybe if there's a war going on, you can't get any eggs, so then the cake's not going to turn out too well. Uh, if you send the recipe to different people, probably they're going to make, you know, slight alterations, they're going to get slightly different ingredients, and the whole thing could turn out, you know, completely differently. So instead of this great cheesecake, you get this horrible mess on the right, which is pretty much what you get if you search for cheesecake disaster on Google, that last website I showed. So, my next attempt is uh, in trying to refining this idea once again was to look at it like IKEA furniture. Um, assuming you're not the person on the left here, but the person on the right who's really happy and like knows what they're doing. So what do you get with IKEA furniture? You get you know a sequence of instructions, kind of like the recipe, that's easy to copy, easy to redistribute. Um, you know you follow the instructions step by step, and hopefully you get the same result. But then also now we don't have to worry about this this variation in, in ingredients because. Uh, you know, we get these, all, all these materials included in the package, that they're already produced, and, you know, it's self-contained. It should be uh, totally consistent. Um, you know, and then the human as assembling the furniture is just the CPU, just following these, following these instructions. And, you know, there's thousands of copies of this stuff. If you go to an IKEA, uh, you know, store, you'll see hundreds and hundreds of the same bookshelf, uh, you know, whatever, all ready to take and transport somewhere else, and then hopefully end up with the same result. Like this bookcase, which, you know, I'm pretty sure that there's like some law in the universe that every millennial in the Western world has lived in at least one house that has this bookshelf. At least I've, I've seen it in many countries around the world. So, okay, great. So we've, we've got a little bit further. Um, we've improved on the recipe idea. We have something that's more reproducible and more self-contained and, and so on. But then we come to this, this other crucial, crucial aspect, which again is a product of this idea that the only dependent resource with, with software is electricity. Um, and this sort of, this is this idea that it can, can it be infinite. This is the infinite software. Um, you know, as long as you have electricity, software can be long running and it can be dynamic. It's kind of alive. 
Um, so, you know, even if you just had a, a, a static state, you know, maybe that's just sitting there, an image that's just sitting there, but more likely you have, you know, a website like Facebook or something where there's some consistency, but also there's a lot of things sort of changing over time, responding to your input, input of other people and things like that. As long as you have, you know, electricity to power the machine, the computer can just keep doing this and the software essentially has a life. Whereas, you know, going back to the recipes uh, or, the, or, the, or, the, or the bookshelf or the shipping containers, you know, these things are all relatively static. Once you put together the bookshelf, it's a, it's a, it's a bookshelf. Once you, build it, once you make the cheesecake, you know, it's probably going to get eaten. Um, if you know any that aren't, let me know. And then as a brief aside, uh, you know, this is, in the Core S office in Berlin, we have a tab at a, at a, at a local uh, eatery that serves this really great cheesecake. And every day at 3.30 p.m., well, 2.30 in, in UTC, I guess, someone has set up a, a Slack bot that will sort of remind us to go and get cheesecake on the tab. And sometimes, um, you know, we're so accustomed to this now, it's kind of like a Pavlovian thing, but, but now sometimes it gets to sort of 3 p.m. and some people were just starting to get kind of nervously excited, like thinking about this cheesecake and get distracted and start kind of tapping and talking about cheesecake. To one of my colleagues pointed out one day, you know, we don't, we don't actually have to wait for the bot. We can just like go and get cheesecake. But we're all very, we're all very faithful to the bot. Anyway, so like with, uh, with uh, yeah, with the IKEA furniture, for example, it also maybe hopefully live a long life, but again, it's not particularly dynamic. It, like the fundamental structure of the bookshelf is not really changing. It's not really alive. It's not you're not executing new instructions every time unless you are like sort of continually putting together this thing. It could be some kind of strange strange reality show. Um, so we see that all of these, even though we've kind of refined our metaphor a bit, it's still kind of reaching limitations of of of, of a metaphor for for software execution. Okay, so we need a new metaphor. Um, so now we finally come to the, come to the, probably of the talk is the obligatory cat drift, cat gif, cat gif, whatever. Uh, and this is the pianola. This is a mechanical piano. Um, and uh, let's dive in a bit more into all the different pieces. So the basic idea here is that a mechanical piano is, 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 is simply like a computer. It's something that just follows a set of instructions. Um, and what you give that mechanical piano is you give it a set of sheet music. Um, this is, you know, a piano roll that has a bunch of instructions for what notes to play and things like that. And then finally, coming back to this idea of software being alive, well, we can kind of think of a musical performance as being alive. A musical performance is, is dynamic. It can be long-lived um, because you can have these different things like, you know, loops or codas in, uh, in music. Uh, no, a little too subtle, that one, codas. Okay, codas, codas. Uh, I, I used to work, whenever I worked for Twitter, this is another little digression, and I would uh, go into, you might have noticed from the accent that I'm originally from, from, from around these parts. Whenever I would go back to the US border um, to get into the country, and the, the person would look at my passport and ask me, oh, where do you work? And I would say, oh, I work at Twitter. And they'd say, sorry, what? I'm like, well, this is San Francisco. The guy should know what Twitter is. Uh, I work at Twitter. They'd say, what, where do you work, son? I'd be like, I work at Twitter. And then invariably, they would uh, <laughs> suddenly recognize it and let me in. Uh, okay, so let's dive in a bit more. The piano roll is basically our sort of software packaging format. So in the music world, it's, it's a set of machine understandable sheet music with things like, you know, it's gonna be different lengths, different sizes, um, but it's very easy to copy and transport. Um, and they can also, very importantly, they can kind of reference each other. So we could have, we could consider, um, for example, just, just submitting a short kind of bar of music and then have that kind of repeat itself uh, several times, as we see in, in software execution. The pianola, the mechanical piano, Again, it kind of just like dumbly consumes the piano roll and, and does, does, you know, does, does what we tell it to. It plays the, plays the different notes one after another, just like our CPU, executing you know, one instruction after another. Um, and unlike you know, the humans in our IKEA example, a piano, piano can basically go forever as long as you provide it some kind of power, which could be uh, electricity, or it could be from a windmill, or it could be um, um, you know, a, a, a hydraulic, I think, um, or by a bicycle, or whatever. So the thing that it's producing, um, it can be self-referential, it can have loops, it can go on forever, potentially. Again, uh, software at the same time is also alive, also limitless. So musical performance um, can really sort of resemble software in the sense that uh, it, can, it can be self-referential, it also can take input from others. You, so you could imagine that um, people are sort of, as, as the song is playing, they can be adding, adding other notes into it um, to, to sort of alter the, alter the piece or dynamically changing the role in real time uh, and to, to, so that the uh, you know, progression of the role can change uh, as, as things evolve. So that's kind of the basic idea. Um, and then I want to push it, push it a little bit further and see where it goes. So 
One of the um, things we all know and love about software containers is this idea of layering, so that we can, um, you know, instead of having to uh, completely rebuild things every time, we can kind of reference previous software containers that we have, um, and then we don't need to hold like a total copy of all of our files every time, but we can just sort of reference one that we already have a copy of, or that someone else has already built that we know we can depend on, and things like that. So this is the idea of you know, layers in, in Docker images, for example. Fortunately, piano rolls can too. Um, you know, you could, you could consider that I, I um, you know, I'm writing a piece of music, um, I'm writing my role, and I reference something else in someone else's piece of music. Um, and, you know, as long as my pianola, pianola can access that somehow, uh, can, it, can, it can build on that. It can, it can take that melody and incorporate that uh, into my piece. Then we can go a little bit further and talk about, start to actually talk about standards. Um, as I mentioned, you know, earlier one of the things we're doing at OCI is to come up with a standard image format, independent of any particular vendor. Um, well, what would that mean for standardizing, um, you know, with containers? So going back to the shipping container idea, I talked about this sort of, uh, this idea of the entry point, so where you start once you've, you've opened up a shipping container. And so, for example, in, in, our, in our image specification, um, that's just a simple, little, a simple little reference saying, you know, the entry point, uh, sorry, got this a little bit backwards. In the, in the music world, we could consider this just to be the entry point of where the song starts playing. Um, so it might be, you know, in the 19th, bar, in the 19th uh, section of the music, just start at bar two. Um, analogously, in, the, in our software container world, um, you know, we tell it which exec executable to run when you want to start executing the software. Another idea is, is around sort of constraints. So we talked a bit earlier about like resource constraints with containers. Um, similarly, in the, in the music world, we might have a constraint around something like uh, you know, volume. We might consider that to be analogous to, to a memory constraint. And we could totally incorporate that into our, into our piano roll, into, into the stuff that we have standardized there, so that we know that um, in, our, in our piano roll, we just add an annotation that, that sort of stipulates uh, maximum volume. And then when our piano, pianola is kind of playing that music, um, if it ever, for some point, it, it's, it's about to sort of exceed that volume, it can just stop playing. Um, over in the software containers world, we just have a very simple annotation called, you know, max memory, for example. Um, and if, the, if our container runtime, you know, exceeds that memory <coughs> while the application is running, the software will stop. Uh, I, where I think it starts to get more interesting as well is things like discovery. Um, so that's, you know, how we can uh, kind of reference each other's things in a known way. So let's say, you know, I've got this, my friend Bono writes this great little melody, melody and I want to use it my song as a layer of my song, but I don't want to like, I don't want to have to store a copy of that, I just want other people with pianolas to be able to get it. So um, what I do is, you know, in my sheet music, my, my piano roll, I just sort of reference it, um, and then, you know, my piano, pianola, what it does is it kind of just looks up at the telephone book, um, it sees, you know, that I've, I'm referencing a piece by Bono, so it looks up Bono, it calls this, you know, automated number, and it says request this, you know, these bars X, Y, Z of this song, um, and it pulls it down, Excuse me, and uh, starts playing it. Similarly, in sort of the software container world, we might see using a system like you know DNS. Um, so this is sort of how we did sort of discovery in the early sort of rocket stuff, for example. Um, would be you know looking up burner.com in, in DNS, connecting to like a well-known port, um, you know at that at that address, um, and then just performing, for example, some kind of HTTP request at a known endpoint uh, to pull down that layer. There's also a bunch of other ideas that I've kind of been started, started thinking about it, but haven't, haven't all written out yet. But things like, um, you know, it's kind of why I'm excited about this idea. Things like multiple clients. So you want to be able to serve, you know, a website, you want to be able to, you don't just want one person to be able to access it, you want multiple people to be able to access it at once. Well, I think you can do this in a Pinola world. You just have some sort of, you know, headphone jack things where different people can plug in and listen to, listen to different music playing um, with the same, from the same piano at the same time. Uh, similarly with a rem remote access thing, we could do that over a telephone wire or using a, some kind of you know, remote audio device. Um, and then as I was talking to this idea about someone, they said I inevitably needed to do something about orchestration, container orchestration, piano orchestras, but uh, I haven't really figured that one out yet. Okay, we have, we've got about five minutes. I'll talk a little bit about OCI, again, just to, to make sure, <laughs> make sure I get it. Um, okay, so as I mentioned earlier, OCI is, is kind of dealing with two main separate specifications, um, but they're connected. Uh, so the first is around the image specification, which is, you know, what goes in a container. Um, and then the second is around how you actually run a container once you have it, once you have a container image. So the image format spec project, um, this is this sort of serialized image format. This is basically a table that um, some of the kind of key features that we're going for there are, you know, it should be content addressable so that you can safely refer to, to, to an image um, and know that once you get it that you can sort of verify the contents against that reference. Um, and it should be platform agnostic so that we can run, uh, you know, images on our different, different kinds of pianos or different kinds of, of, ex of executable runtimes. 
Um, and then there are things like, you know, signatures. We want to be able to show that we can distribute these securely and that, you know, what you get is, you know, what, I, what, I, what I've uh, created. Um, and finally, we want to provide that, you know, naming thing where we can, um, you know, delegate naming so I can, I can safely go and get someone else's uh, container image based on, based on just the, you know, the reference that they give me without needing to store a copy of it myself all the time. Um, so this is the thing that you distribute. This is basically a tarball with a bunch of, bunch of stuff inside it. Um, and then we have kind of a few key manifests in the specification, um, the image manifest, the image index, and, and the config, uh, which is just metadata, again, about you know, what's inside the image, um, you know, maybe some, some, some references to other layers that the image can, can, can call out to, um, things like that. Um, and then the cryptographic addressability is, is, again, that's taking a cryptographic hash of the image to make sure that we can kind of securely reference it um, and, and, and access, uh, sorry, reference it from other images. So the image format is, is pretty much just derived directly from the, again, from the de facto Docker standard, from v2.2. Um, we're just sort of taking that and writing it down in a vendor neutral place so that anyone can use it and build on it. So it's really just the Docker v2.2 format with various tweaks that we think um, you know, are critical to happen uh, within the confines of it being kind of back to its compatible. So changing some mime, type, mime types, um, <clears throat> But for all intents and purposes, we should still be able to reference those old layers that, you know, that uh, exist in all these registries today and that people have on disk. We should still be able to use those within the OCI image format. Um, and again, it's sort of a starting point for, for future innovation uh, with, with all this stuff. That's intended to interoperate with, with the runtime spec, um, which is uh, you know, what actually defines what's running on the system. Um, I'll get to that in a second. Again, the United, just sort of visualizing this very briefly, um, you know, on the, on the left here, we have what would be a layer, which is basically just our table of, of different files and, uh, in our container. So, you know, the libraries that it depends on, the executable, um, stuff like that. In the middle, we have this, this, what we call an image index, which references, for example, different um, architectures and, 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 and platforms that it might run on. I mean, that allows you to have a sort of multi-arch, for example, image that could potentially reference uh, different, different configurations. Um, and then finally, on the right, we have this configuration, which is the bit that actually tells you how to run the container. So uh, this bit on the right is what ends up getting converted uh, to the runtime specification, which details is, is in much more detail about what exactly is going to happen uh, during the execution. Digging inside the image, again, this is all the stuff that I said was pretty boring, so we can, we can go through it pretty quickly. It's basically just the table with a bunch of, bunch of files on disk. Um, you can see, you know, one thing to call out here would be that, again, we're referencing everything content uh, uh, cryptographically by their cryptographic hash. Um, so all of the sort of constituent images and things inside the thing uh, are laid out in the, in the hash, and then we have a few different uh, manifest files to be able to make sense of these. To give you a quick idea of one of the manifests, um, so here, for example, we see that you know, it's referencing some different layers um, that contain actual uh, full uh, uh, files. And it's also referencing a config, which um, you know, could exist in that same table, might actually exist somewhere else. Um, because we're referencing it uh, by, by hash, we can be you know, pretty confident that we're gonna get the right thing where, wherever it's from. And then finally, we get to kind of the runtime spec, just talking about this briefly. Um, this is just like the on-disk layout, like right before you're about to execute the container, um, telling your runtime exactly, you know, exactly what to happen. So after you've pulled down all the files, written them all to disk, um, and you're ready to actually just start running the software. And then the runtime spec defines things like various lifecycle verbs of you know, what it means to start, create, kill a container, stuff like that. Um, it also has this, you know, it's sort of platform agnostic, um, but to sort of facilitate that, it has a bunch of, um, so, like, so there's sort of a bunch of common configuration, then there's also a bunch of platform con specific uh, configuration files uh, as appropriate for different platforms. As a very simple example of one part of the runtime spec, um, you know, this is how an OCR compliant runtime might uh, represent the state of a container that's running on a system. Uh, so any, any OCR compliant runtime should be able to export, uh, should export some, some state in this kind of known format about what's actually happening. Oops. The wrong slide. No, that's we're pretty much on the on thirty minutes. So I'm happy to take a couple of questions um, and also encourage anyone to get involved if you like. All of this happens in public on the mailing list um, and on the two uh, formats. Um, and there's also a few other people here who are pretty actively involved in this stuff as well. So um, thanks. I'm going to leave it on one last little joke I saw this morning for anyone who's following the crazy stuff happening in the world. But that's all I have, so thank you. Rapturous applause, et cetera. <laughs> <laughs>